Well, welcome to Hemp Barons, Tamar Azar. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You, sir, are doing some of the most important work in hemp. As we often talk about here, we're so grateful for CBD and hemp extract and cannabinoids on so many levels, and yet it is the trillion-dollar industries. It's the fiber and oil seed industries in hemp uh, that are going to really help the planet create jobs, stimulate the economy, and make a healthier world. So thank you, the Hempville out of North Carolina, for grabbing this opportunity and this challenge by the horns. Let's start, if we could, Tamar, and in you telling us how you came to hemp, and then I want to get right back into the very important and critical work with products and services that you're doing at the Hempville. But what brought you to hemp, brother? Sure. Um, so my background is engineering and technology. Um, that's what I've been doing throughout my career, um, coaching, consulting, in automation and control system industries on the large scale manufacturing. Um, so my with my 401k, I had some some of the cannabis stocks uh, in Canadian market um, when they legalized in I think in 20, 2018. Around the same time when the Farm Bill revision of 2018 was you know coming out. So I just I just came across it, stumbled upon it just because I had some stocks and I would see um, the waves going up and down in the stock market based on industrial hemp. And I just start reading about it. The, what is it and what are the uses and all that? And it it just it was just amazing when I came across it that you can convert an agriculture crop into an industrial manufacturing raw material and you can create sustainable products. And it just blew my mind that how uh, simple it sounds, um, but it's possible. It's doable. It has been happening um, with some different agricultural crops, but now it's time for him. So I just start reading, reading more about it. Just just getting into it, uh, understanding more. Um, and I, I met um, Gary and his his farming cooperative that has been growing hemp in North Carolina for three years um, for some other companies in the past. And I met those guys, uh, had a long conversation, have been in their co-op meeting, trying to understand the, what are the gaps. And then I figured out that the farmers want to grow it. Uh, they're pretty willing to grow the industrial, the row crop, but then there's no processing. And without that processing, you cannot take that to the next level or the next step that, that are required. So we start digging more into it. And this seems like it's kind of, you know, in my um, in in my field, sort of sort of speak, equipment and manufacturing and those things. So I I just went on a hunt on finding decodicators, finding equipment that can process, that can separate the fiber from the herd. And most of them, as you're probably familiar with, are coming from overseas. A lot of companies overseas, and and the cost start from five million dollars and above. And I personally did not feel um, confident going out and raising that kind of capital without knowing what are we going to be doing with it? Because I know the ROI is going to be long. Investors are going to be on my tail to produce and generate capital and revenue, which is difficult considering the market. So I looked at Hemp Train, some of the Canadians, and I came across Formation Ag. Uh, and our, our business model, our goal is to revitalize local farming and manufacturing industry. So I wanted to work with an American manufacturer because I understand the hassle of shipping equipment from overseas to United States. Your your ratings are different, your standards are different, and, and there's just a lot more things that goes with it when you start flying people and parts from the other country. So to reduce the cost, I, I wanted to work with somebody in the United States. So this is how I came across Formation Egg out of Colorado. Uh, and I work work with their looked at their equipment um work with their engineers uh, bought their prototype uh, so all of that 401k that i had invested in the in the canadian market i took it out and <laughs> invested into a decodicator um my family uh, they own they own a slaughterhouse uh, one of my uncles they own a slaughterhouse they have been running for 25 years in north carolina the chicken processing site of that was dead for 10 years um, so i asked my uncle if i can convert that chicken processing into hemp processing um, and he he was like sure go ahead and do it so <laughs> so this is where we put our decodicator um, worked with gary found the farmers asked them if they can grow uh, some test acreage for us uh, 
around 100 acres was our target. Uh, commissioned that equipment, found some of the markets that were where all the processed hemp is going to go to. Um, and basically, in the first quarter of 2019, we were all in. Uh, we created the company, uh, placed an order for that equipment, got all the prep work to bring Decorticator into North Carolina so that at least we can start facilitating the farmers in that region, in that area. To, to process that long, strong stock. And I just want to sort of help frame some things for uh, for the listeners here, of course, is that we've been having, as you very well described here, to put one foot in front of the other in terms of infrastructure. Um, and that's what we're talking about when we say there's no equipment to process this stuff. Now, hemp, of course, very useful plant. We can use every single part of the plant, even, of course, the roots, which have those valuable triterpenes. But the bottom line is we've got hemp extracts, flowering tops and leaves. We've got hemp oil seed, which is grain nutrient dense for humans and animals, but also incredible industrial purposes, sealants and coatings and plastics, etc. And then the longest, strongest fiber in the world, paper, textiles, building materials, biocomposites, nanotechnology, um, you know, somebody stopped me, all of those things. And what we love um, about hemp is that it's the longest, strongest fiber in the world after it's harvested and processed. But man, it's the longest, strongest fiber in the world. So harvesting it and processing it is a whole nother thing. And and just a, another quick high level to put it in perspective for our listeners is, so for example, Canada, as you well know, Tamor has been regulating the crop since 1998, but basically became world leaders in hemp bulk food ingredients and grain processing. So their major infrastructure went into grain processing, not extracts at all. That's a brand new thing and you still have to work under their marijuana laws. Then the European Union and certainly China. China has, of course, uh, been has taken the lead in hemp textiles and even learned how to degum the fibers post prohibition. But so I would say European Union and China for building that infrastructure for fiber, and it's still a huge, in a sense, still it is infinitesimal or infant state, um, given the potential for the crop. But here in the United States, we went right into extracts and we've been sitting here asking farmers to grow this valuable, high potential fire burr and oil seed crop without them having infrastructure to process it. And, and yet and we've also been asking the investors to invest in this infrastructure when there isn't or aren't a lot of farmers growing the fiber and oil seed types of hemp yet working together working in tandem one step in front of the other um we are starting to do that and and then the last piece of that would be um that the ROI as you say that return on investment folks you know we are looking for people especially when it comes to fiber who can wait that five years, build it, and they will come. But if you're looking for some ROI within a year for this promising, versatile, valuable crop, you're you're basically out of luck. And then, and then North Carolina, where you are, of course, has been a hemp capital long before we were even growing under the 2014 uh, pilot program. As you well know, multiple hempcrete homes and the very first permitted hempcrete home in the United States of America for the was uh, done for that mayor of, of Asheville, North Carolina with Hemp Technologies who I work with. So what you are doing and laying out here is just so unbelievably important. So now you've gotten us to, you've got the decorticator into North Carolina. So the farmers have a, a place, a, an infrastructure to process. Let's talk a little bit more about what what you're doing with that decorticator. And then of course, we'll get into your plans and, and what you're developing. Sure, sure. So, so the big the big thing um, that we learn after purchasing that decorticator is to understand the complete cycle. So, understand where the seed genetics is going to come from. How are we going to plant it? How are we going to harvest? How are we going to do testing to make sure it's under the legal THC limit? And then how to bail it? How to deliver it to the processing location? I mean, there were so many learning steps in between. And then right after, when, when you get the bale, it just looks like a hay bale, um, 600, 750 pounds each. And then you offload it, you store it. Then the humidity 
becomes another factor that kicks in. As you know, the weather in, in North Carolina is completely different than what, we, what you guys have um, on the West Coast. So humidity is a big factor, and it does not help in the process of decortication because it does not let the fiber separate it from the wooden core. So uh, continuous conversation with Formation Ag. Uh, I had Brandon and some other engineers from Formation Ag fly over to North Carolina a couple of times along with the parts because we, we, we all had the same goal that we are trying to establish or set up this marketplace here, right? And you mentioned ROI. The, the good thing with this whole process was that I personally wanted to learn how to crawl before I start walking. This was, this was the kind of amount of money, money that I can afford, that our business can afford, that we can sacrifice to learn, to go through this process. Somebody has to do it. So why not us? And so we did that and we went through that process. So that whole decortication, we learned a lot of things. We got, we got our hands dirty on that equipment, on the crop, on the farming side. I'm not a farmer. I have nothing to do with farming. But what I learned in the past two years is, is a lot, is a load of information on the farming side. And I'm so happy that I'm aware of those things now. So right after decortication, during the processing, hiring team, running the eight-hour shift, we broke that equipment so many times. Um, and then this was part of the process. So then Formation Egg, uh, we worked with them. And of course, they, you know, they released a second version of that equipment, which, I mean, me and Brandon, we, we spent eight, nine hours in Michigan when we were at the IHAM conference. And before the conference started, we were sitting down looking at the 3D models of, of that equipment and how we're going to make it work out. So, so, so this is how we're making the progress. And now they're working on uh, their newer equipment, which is Genesis. So this is, this is, this is a, I, I thought, in my opinion, this is a right way to take a step getting into this market. Instead of investing millions of dollars into that business that is not established so far, invest as much as you can afford. If you're a farmer, you want to grow a couple of test plots, that's fine. You're not going to make any money off of it, but, but at least you will get your, you know, your testing phase out. You'll get that itch out. You will learn a lot of things about it. So, and another big thing uh, about our farming procedure, um, and Gary Sykes is, is a, uh, you know, he, he talks about it all the time, is the regenerative process, uh, the agriculture practices that what we have to do. Um, and again, it's, it's, life is just like that. You got to wait for something to get developed and healthy. And then you will get to the point where, where you can start harvesting it. So we often say, you know, hemp is an, is an ancient crop. If you are wanting immediate gratification from an ancient crop that is not in a hurry, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Right. <laughs> uh, hemp tames us. We really don't tame hemp. And, and that goes basically for all forms of cannabis. And, and I love this lesson that you're saying here. You wanted to get your hands dirty. You wanted to crawl before you walk. You want to walk before you run. And, and hemp demands that. And, uh, and it demands it because we, we're at a critical point, right, in human and, and planetary evolution. And we've got to get this right, which also dovetails into exactly what you're saying with, with Gary Sykes and the whole regenerative agricultural movement. It's irresponsible of us to introduce this versatile, valuable crop with so much potential uh, for healing and sustainability and regeneration without also uh, discussing these regenerative agricultural techniques. And as I often say, without rainfall in the top six inches of soil, we'd all be dead. So, uh, you know, so very, very Im important here. And, um, and I want to make sure that we also hit um, after we get the most important piece, which is what what Hemphill is doing for, for the farmers and developing for the farmers. Um, are some of these more realistic because you and Brandon from Formation Ag, who he's just so brilliant as is Corbett uh, Hefner, but it's such a great company. You, I recently was able to um, be a, a guest, a, a viewer of a webinar that you two just knocked out of the park with practical information and really discuss some of these, what makes an acre viable, what uh, sort of scale viability, small but viable project. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff you, 
the magic bean stories don't fall for those. Um, I don't, I'm not telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm basically singing your song right now, which is magic beans, pie in the sky, miracles. No, what there is is reality and there's agriculture. Um, so with that, brothers, tell us some more about what, uh, what the Hemphill is, is being able to offer for products and services and what's on the horizon. So, so right after decortication, um, we we distributed mark we distributed products um, across the United States market. Uh, so we learned about the packaging, we learned about the specifications, we we learned about different processes. So all the things that we read on the internet that you can do twenty five thousand different things with hemp plant. At least I wanted to test five out of twenty five thousand, right? So so that we can test it. So so we start distributing product. Some companies that we knew organizations that we knew who are working on it, for example, USHBA. Uh, so I, I donated, we donated them some herd for, for their different products. They wanted to build a dog house. Uh, there's there's uh, a nonprofit organization here in South Carolina that are building a self-sustainable structure. Um, we donated some herd for them and now they're coming back to actually uh, create that structure, which is going to have solar panels on it made out of hempcrete uh, so that Again, it's self-sustainable structure. Uh, a company out of Vermont had made a hemp guitar using our fiber. Uh, we had made paper products, handmade paper with a company um, out in Kentucky. So slowly, slowly with, with some, like I said, testing five, 10 of those products, uh, I start going to my originalities, the engineering and technology side. So I start building relationship with universities and research centers. Start, start supplying them hemp products, the fiber, the herd, the microns, so that they can start playing with it. They can start producing products that what can we offer in the market with the commercialization in mind. So now we have a pretty good relationship with NC State, with the Department of Agriculture, uh, where we're growing test plots. We're supplying some of the seed genetics to them as well. Um, where the idea is to make the farmers successful, we need to know what's going to grow best in what climate conditions and latitude and the soil conditions. So we're offering all of our services to the universities. Uh, we're working with uh, Southern University, the Southern University to set up hemp program in Louisiana. They're just getting online. Uh, so we're working as industrial partner and consultants with them. Uh, there are some other organizations that we're working as industrial partners, including universities uh, and private, for-profit and nonprofit organizations to get this whole thing started. So consultancy, um, industrial partnership is what we provide services. Um, we also consult group that wants to set up hemp farming and processing operation in their region. So pr we provide those services with, with the techni technicalities, with the farming, and also some on the sales and marketing side as well. Now, this is so important for folks who are, and for farmers and for businesses, entrepreneurs of every size, really, who want to get in on this opportunity, who recognize that the hemp extract bubble is bursting before our very eyes, just in trim. And again, thank goodness for cannabinoids. But as we know, in 2019, technically speaking, enough hemp extract varieties were grown in the state of Kentucky for every American to take 20 milligrams of hemp extract a day. So um, so really we're moving into fiber and oil seed and from the field to the processor. So the genetics are so important. Obviously you recognize that. Um, and, and so folks can actually pick up the phone and hire Hempville, um, you and everyone at the Hempville really, then to assist them with, frankly, that supply chain process. That is correct. So we uh, we work with, with groups who are in the process of their um, in acquiring funding, who are in the process of grant writing, who, who are in the process of setting up their business plan, and they just want to know how many seed per acre they want to put in the ground and how much the yield is going to be and how and you know what's the market and all of those things basically that's where we come in as an extended arm to their group and their companies to fill all of those gaps to expedite things um, and provide them that information that we have learned in the past two years so 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 that is that is one one kind of services that we provide the second one 
is more geared towards the corporations um, and organizations, which is research and product development. So, so let's say if a plastic company, uh, which we're working with a couple at the moment, um, but if a plastic company wants to incorporate hemp into their existing production setup that they have, they don't have to change that equipment or any of that. We would work with them and lay out a plan and conduct those testing with that organization, how to incorporate hemp, and what are going to be the benefits of different recipes that if they incorporate it, what percentage is going to give them what attributes of it. So, so we perform the research and the product development by working with organizations and actually working with the universities and research centers. You are really chopping the wood and carrying the water here, Tamor, and um, as, as you well know. So we're really talking about not only folks who are looking to get in, existing farmers looking to add hemp into the rotation, new farmers, although I, every time I say that, I'm like, you know what, if you're a new farmer, maybe you want to look at, I don't know, getting into processing. <laughs> As opposed, because, you know, where the existing farmers, you know, are, are, are doing great with this, adding it to the, to the rotation. Now, and, but having said that, existing businesses that want to add a sustainable product, you know, folks get the misimpression, and I always call it the um, misguided oversimplification of hemp. If we add hemp to it, it's automatically biodegradable. It's automatically this or that. And the bottom line is, no, we could still have a fairly toxic product, but if we're adding hemp to it, believe me, it's less toxic than it was before uh, there was hemp being added to it. So existing businesses, of all of those different uh, industries that I had discussed before, whether they're bioplastics or bioresins and co composites, building materials, textiles, as you may know, uh, hemp traders just did the first three post-prohibition blends of America. Now, I don't believe that the fiber itself came from the United States. We'll get there. But it was actually blended, three different blends here in the United States. So textiles, nanotechnology, building materials, all of those things. Um, so you can really help put one foot in front of the other and chop that wood and carry that water with uh, these companies who are interested. You are that arm, an extended team, basically a team member. Right, right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. For 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 the textile development, we're we're uh, we're on a consortium with Patagonia and and we have brands uh, with our NC State University leading that consortium. So uh, the, again, the efforts are all geared towards how we're gonna establish the marketplace for the hemp that is grown here, processed here in America, and hopefully being utilized here in, in America. So as you as you were talking about, the, the purpose, now the the movement for, for the company, for our company, the Hempville, the research and development arm is to find more outlets for the farmers. The more outlets we can find for the farmers, you would see more farmers getting on board, uh, old and new. You would see more processing centers popping up on the map because there's more demand. Um, and then once you start doing mass production, then, of course, the prices are going to start going down. So so there, there it's, a, it's an uphill battle at the moment. Um, I understand it. We, we understand it. Um, and this is why we got into this side of things, not the cannabinoids uh, or the CBD per se, because I I saw personally I saw a gap uh, that needs to be filled in this industry. So that's how we we just jumped into it. Uh, hopefully, we'll start producing revenue um, for ourselves and the other organizations that we're working with pretty soon. Uh, those are the expectations. But like you said, it's a movement, um, and it's not one company cannot do it. It's going to take a team effort, and, and I, that's why we're all here together. Attention Cannabis Podcast listeners. You can now listen to your favorite cannabis podcast ad-free with the MJ Bulls mobile app. Just download the free MJ Bulls mobile app to your smartphone to start enjoying cannabis podcasts with no commercials. Go to Apple Apps or Google Play to get the MJ Bulls Cannabis Podcast app today. Absolutely. And uh, and as many folks have, have heard me said, our listeners, of course, ideally, we need 
hemp processing facilities within every 50 to 100 square miles of the hemp biomass feedstock, and it may become regional. For example, here I hail from the state of Washington and where they've had, we've had legal medical cannabis since 98, legal adult use cannabis in 2012, took us four more years to plant a legal hemp seed here. And Washington pretty much is kind of, at least in this nascent stage, thinks of itself as a marijuana state, as, as an adult use and medical cannabis state. So um, it's going to, and we're growing some more grain than we were uh, last year. And so we'll see some grain processing facilities pick up, but you know, it may be that some states decide or some regions such as let's say the Emerald Triangle and Humboldt County in Northern California and Southern Oregon may decide, you know what, we don't want any kind of fiber hemp competing with this other form of cannabis. And, and we may find um, that just certain states and certain areas are more grain versus fiber. And then within that, you know, different parts of, uh, of that processing. So it's going to be fascinating to see um, how it all pops up, but we can't do it uh, without services like, and, and products, frankly, like the hemp bill has to offer, because this is a big team effort here. And there, there are so many different aspects. When I see someone call themselves, for example, a hemp expert, like I've been in hemp for 30 years. I'm not a, a hemp expert. There are little pieces, hemp law and policy. Okay. I'll wear that hat, but hemp expert, what does that even mean? If this is the hugest, you know, thing. So we've, it really takes getting the right people um, um, on your team. And it sounds like that's what the hemp bill is doing. Can we, can we talk also, well, it is what the hemp bill is doing. Can we talk a little bit about the products that are currently available through the hemp bill? Sure. So <clears throat> the, the first step of processing or what we call initial processing, you get, you get three main products after that. Um, you get raw fiber, you get herd, and then you get microns. So depending on which market you are in, um, those products can be raw materials for for your production uh, process. Um, other than that, we're 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 a uh, hemp innovative company. That's what we like to call ourselves. So um, hempcrete art and small block kit uh, is something that we launched this year, so that we can so that we we separate the stigma first of all of of being a cousin from a cannabis family. We just want to separate that. I mean, even parents have bought it for their kids so that they can so that they can mix that hemp herd with the lime binder, with the addition of water, and put it into any mold that they want to. Um, so so it's a very that was the purpose behind launching that uh, art kit is to get everybody familiar with it, get their hands dirty on that thing, and be comfortable with it. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's nothing wrong saying that you are buying a Christmas present, which is hemp herd, for example, for your grandkids. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so, so that's what we're focused on. Product side, this, this is what we're trying to do is to come up uh, with creative ideas, is to come up that would help the whole community. Um, our plan down the road is we're gonna get fire department involved and you know, whenever we do some fire testing and, and actually get them some things done uh, in the practical manner of things. Um, it's not that we want to get something from overseas and just start distributing it here. It's going to kill the purpose. So we want to, we want to engage the farmers. They need to learn as well as the processors, as well as the market and as well as the consumers that they need to understand that what they're buying and what they're spending their dollars at. In every way. And it is such a wonderful way to really get people not imagine. I don't have to ask you to do that. You've already done it. All of the lessons and things that you're exposing a family, a student, a child, an adult, a contractor, a real estate agent to when you give get a hempcrete. Uh, sample block it into their hands, you know, and they really get to get it under their fingernails, as I say, and get to smell that curing lime and, and feel it and, and say, oh, because I've done so many hempcrete workshops and folks expect, of course, for that block to be just so heavy because they're used to that heavy, dense Portland cement. And for them to realize this is kind of oatmeal-like and uh, unbelievable how light it is once it's cured and just all of those things. And and of course, getting involved with um, with those local building and planning and fire department. In fact, when Hemp Technologies, uh, you know, went obviously it 
was a bit of a leg up to be doing the first permanent hempcrete home for a city mayor. <laughs> so we had a, right, little, right. a little in there, but it was certainly immediately getting involved with the fire department in Asheville, North Carolina, and showing them that this was a non-combustible, uh, you know, mold rot, fire pest resistant construction infill that would last hundreds of years and provide uh, just so much energy efficiency and superior air quality and, and you're doing that with these things and I love that you've got um you know the herd and the fiber and and so and let me ask you just because we all have slightly different dictionaries but um just confirming for the audience here that when you say fiber versus herd you mean fiber being the bast fiber or the outer bark of the stock versus uh the woody core which some people call shivs but I of course call herd just like you do is that what you mean by separating out the term fiber, comma, herd? Correct. That is that is correct. So so the fiber is going to be your raw fiber that is the outer layer of the plant. Uh, the decodication process, this is exactly what it does. It separates the fiber, fiber from the herd without damaging it. Um, so there was hammer mills and some other processes that are being used in the past, but now it's most of the roller breaker style that separates the fiber from the herd and gets the herd into smaller pieces and you use the fiber for different applications and you use the herd for different applications. It's so wonderful to see how those lines sort of expand, such as with at Donagro, you know, it just started out herd, animal bedding, now it's non-woven mats for growing and and um you know insulation as well and so we just get to that's that initial process the hemp fill is coming in as the hero here in this part of the region and saying listen this is a this is the first thing we want to be able to do and then with these raw materials we can feed all of these different industries 100 percent correct yes that that is exactly how we uh entered this market is to take care of that problem first that was initial processing and and now is the next problem that is being presented to us that is the product development and the research side of things um so so you mentioned genetics um uh, joy i want to i want to talk a little bit about that so how how i am seeing is different genetics are going to get placed and grown in different parts of the country depending on the market that is being driven from so for example if you look at the bioplastic or the automotive industry, right, the most of the stuff that is going to get grown up there would be targeted towards that market. Um, and the strains and the genetics uh, that you would say, the testing would be focused on the attributes that is required by the bioplastic or the automotive companies. As compared to here in North Carolina, for example, which is a huge textile uh, focused state. Here, the genetics are going to be grown mostly that are focused on the heavy tensile strength and the stronger fiber, per se. And then you go towards the California, I don't know, it might be, it might be the fire-resistant uh, powers of, of hempcrete that might drive that market. And we, we do have a customer, uh, two of them, matter of fact, in California, that they're working with the county, their local counties, and developing um, the footprints of of those small houses that are made out of hempcrete so they're long lasting and and their target is to overcome the homeless situation in california um so so that's that's what they're dealing with i mean there, there's so many cool products that are happening and i'm happy that our company is involved in in a lot of them being a supplier being a researcher um being putting ourselves at risk <laughs> but but i mean again this, this is how you learn this is how you learn about things is putting yourself out but again you just got to make sure you only gamble that much that you can afford that nothing that is not going to disrupt you by any mean this is the only how much you would like to uh play with and in the first few years while the market is developing while the market is infant Absolutely. And the fortunes that have been, you know, invested in the last 30 years, uh, you know, so many pioneers, um, as, as do I, who, of course, it was the 401k, it was the home equity line of credit, it was their parents' retirement, um, you know, all in pursuit of this plan. It, it's a very purpose-driven, passion-driven um, industry. And, uh, 
and, but we want people to have successful experiences. So we're very grateful that you um, have invested your 401k here, brother. We cannot wait for you to start <laughs> turning uh, turning that that profit. But that's a very, very important lesson. And, uh, and in fact, you and Brandon, as I had mentioned before, um, lots of, if you could just give us, there are all kinds of pie in the sky. And we certainly hear that a lot in hemp extract. Folks are unfortunately unsuspecting farmers um, who are such trusting integral you know members of our community the heroes of our of the nation the heroes of our own states and and of course around the world um but they're being told you know you're going to make 10 million dollars or or let's be more realistic even those who say you're going to make ten thousand dollars an acre versus the eighty dollars an acre you've been making in hay you buy my magic beans and you're going to make ten thousand dollars an acre on hemp extract um so there there's that but versus you know, uh, hemp grain or, or hemp fiber. Of course, you're more specific right now to hemp fiber. Can you give us a, a sort of a depiction or a demonstration of, of what a, a scale is realistic at right now? Good, good question. I'm glad you asked that question. So so we did that calculation here, here in Southeast with the farmers that are growing grow crops. We did the same calculation in Michigan and Los Angeles as well. Um, not Texas yet, but the the idea behind that whole thing was to understand the value of the row crop, right? To understand that what we're presenting and what we're bringing to the table is nothing different than another row crop. It's not a quick millionaire scheme. You're gonna treat it as another row crop, and you harvested it. Um, you would make definitely you you would make a decent amount of money, but not not anything closer to CBD or or cannabis per se. Um, probably my target and my company, my team's target is that we provide uh, enough capital, enough information, enough resources to the farmer to make them successful. And it's not just the dollar amount. There are different factors that that play into that is, you, you know, your poundage of seed per acre that you're going to plant. How far are you from the processing location is another big factor. Um, and if you look at if you look at the European model uh, of the fiber industry per se, the decodication or the decodicators are part of a farming equipment that is owned by the farming co-op. So if a farming co-op owns a decodicator, then automatically you are reducing the transportation cost. Automatically you are giving more money to the farmers right away, right off the bat. So instead of distributing the raw fiber bales to the processor and letting them process, you as a farming cooperative, can own a decodicator and then work with the companies like Hempville where we can take the herd and the fiber from you guys as a farming cooperative and then distribute in the market, right? So farmers do what they're good at, industry does what they're good at, and we just build a bridge in the center. God, I love it. And and hemp, of course, breed cannabis in all of its form, but and of course, hemp is breeding cooperation. It is breeding uh, every kind of commercial permaculture that I can possibly um, think of in my mind. And that really is the answer. And I really believe um, for as much as I love this plant, and it's been such a huge part of my life for, for these three decades now, that that's part of hemp's mission is to teach us that in every business sector, to teach us that in every agricultural sector, cooperation is really the answer for us. And, and to get out of this mindset of competition and more into this mindset of cooperation. And in fact, I always give him credit for it. Bob Hoban, one of my favorite hamsters, and I'm sure you know who he is, uh, coined the term uh, coopetition. Uh, so hemp will, hemp will get us there. Um, such an important, incredible work that you're doing, uh, Tamor, not just obviously in the southeast region of the country, but your reach now beyond um, into multiple states with the work that you're doing. I cannot wait to watch uh, things unfold, to have you back on again, and to make sure uh, that I recommend to some of my own clients, of course, that they reach into the Hempville um, for the information that they really need to know as they walk and don't run responsibly into these many, many opportunities. 
Brother, before we go, is there anything that I didn't ask you or give you an opportunity to say that you want to make sure um, you deliver to the audience? No, I think we, we covered pretty well. Um, it's just, you know, let's just keep on pounding. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time. Uh, we have to understand that it's going to take some time. Let's just not make it a, a competitive market from the get-go. Um, and most of the people who know me personally as well, I, I'm, I love filtering uh, some some of the wrong information that is out there in the market. And so as when it comes to the brokers and the distributors and dealers, and as you have seen in the CBD market, I mean, we don't want we don't want the fiber and the grain market to be like that market. Um, so so we all have to work together. We all have to be realistic with our approaches. Um, and and the products that we're looking at um, and the farmers that we're going to be supporting. Because, again, at the end of the day, us as a company, we just want to revitalize, give those farmers a new life with a new crop, with an alternative, and and just have a sustainable um, cycle for, for him. And then where we can where we can help our our environment, we can regenerate the resources that we're using so that we just don't run out of them. I mean, we just got to think of the generation that are going to come after us. So if we if we go with that mindset, I don't think there is any problem. I don't think there's there's going to be any trouble in hemp being successful as a sustainable material for us. I could not have said that better myself. Thank you 10 times over, Tamar, for everything that you do. Uh, listeners, please go to mjbulls.com, Hemp Barons, and we'll get you all the links to get you to Tamar uh, and the Hemp Fell based out of North Carolina. Again, thank you, brother. Wishing you so many wind beneath your wings and can't wait to see how things continue to unfold. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and providing us this, this platform so so your listeners can hear us out too thank you joy such a pleasure brother thank you back